so much for joining us uh, for this final formal session of the afternoon. Um, it's my thrill to be uh, leading off um, as chair of this panel. Uh, my name is Ruth Ward, uh, and I am the Director of Knowledge of the Government Legal Department. Uh, you can read my bio, but I just want to say a little bit about the Government Legal Department, because Lady Rose did the most fantastic sales job about <laughs> uh, the interest and career opportunities that stem from working uh, for the, the Government Legal Service, and particularly the Government Legal Department. Uh, we are the biggest in-house legal department. We have 2,000 or so lawyers who uh, do uh, litigation, expert commercial and employment services, and a wide range of advisory work. Uh, and uh, we have the best mission statement, I think, of anybody. It's to help the government govern well within the rule of law. If anybody is interested or knows anybody who might be interested in... Uh, furthering their legal career with the government legal department, please speak to me afterwards. And thank you to Lady Rose for her inspiring words about that. Um, so it is my thrill to uh, chair and introduce this panel this afternoon, focusing on AI and the law, the road ahead. And there's no better time really to be talking about that because recent developments and media coverage in generative AI have generated so, many in, so much interest, so many questions on this topic. And there's no better place to be having this panel uh, than at the University of Cambridge, and in particular in the Faculty of Law that is doing so much interesting work uh, in this space. And there are no better people to be hearing from on this topic than the three experts that I have with me this afternoon. So first, we have Catherine Apps, uh, barrister, and Casey, as we say now, at 39 Essex Chambers. And she specialises in cases where public and private law collide, or where there are overlapping issues of English law, EU law, and international law. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, next, we have um, Dr. Emilia Lenate, Assistant Professor here at the University of Cambridge, co-director of the Centre for European Legal Studies and fellow of the Lauterpak Centre for International Law. Hello, everyone. And last but certainly not least, we have Imogen Ireland, senior associate lawyer specialising in intellectual property at the global law firm Hogan Lovells. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> so, as I noted, so many questions about the law and AI. And uh, in this session, we're going to cover three areas of questions uh, in discussion with the panel, and then I will endeavor that there will be good time, 10 minutes at the end, for questions from the audience, and I hope you'll take uh, that opportunity. So the first question that we're going to talk about is, what is the global landscape? What is the global legal landscape for AI? How does the law respond to the many questions that are being posed? And we're going to hear first from Catherine. So necessarily, this is going to be quite a kind of general principle sort of overview. And the way I put it like this, it's almost like a sandwich. So at the bottom of the sandwich, pretty much every country in the world has distinct areas of law that already exist that AI might have some intersection with. So we've got law of contract, we've got the law of intellectual property that Imogen's an expert in. We've got the law of confidential information, and this becomes extremely important with things like large language models. We've got laws um, against discrimination. Um, we've got laws that relate to data protection, personal data protection. We've got laws about administrative decision making. So when the public um, or when the government or local authorities make decisions that affect individuals, we've got competition law and we've got employment law. Um, and also, in particular areas of technology, law of technical standards, which I know doesn't tend to be terribly glamorous, but is actually very important in this field. You've then, if we move up a level in the sandwich, um, some of those laws are harmonized um, across particular geographical areas, or um, the sort of best example of this is, for instance, in the EU. Now, the UK is in an interesting position as regards the EU these days, of course, being outside, but quite a lot of our law inside, so our national law is either derived from EU law, developed from EU law, or intended to be harmonised with EU law. And that gets quite complicated and will get quite complicated going forwards. 
You also have the law of human rights. Um, so in Europe, we have the Council of Europe and the European Court of Human Rights, of course, separate from the EU. Um, and there's specific case law and um, human rights which are engaged, the right to privacy, the right, the right to private and family life, Article 8, freedom of expression, Article 10, and so on and so forth. Um, and there's it been interesting case law very recently, actually, about the use of AI facial recognition on the Moscow Metro. Um, so an interesting discussion um, in the European Court of Human Rights. You then, on top of that sort of regional level, um, uh, have uh, public international law, so the law of international treaties. Um, you don't have much that is at the treaty level specifically regulating AI, but you do have treaties on, for instance, the um, Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW. So that, and of course, you've also got treaties um, in relation to the law of you know, armed conflict, law, uh, war, weapons, um, and that. Um, so this is new technology, which doesn't sort of start in terms of legal terms with sort of nothing there already. There is already quite a lot of law um, there. And there are, of course, discussions about is there a need for more law, and if so, at what level? So international treaty level, EU level or national, or all of those in different um, sectors. There's, law, there's questions about do we regulate the technology or do we regulate the use or do we do a bit of both? Do we need broad principles? Do we need extremely granular law? Um, or do we need human rights? Or again, do we need a combination of those and how are they going to work through? So we've got some really interesting questions that actually bring us back to some real fundamentals about what it is that we do as lawyers, what it is that law actually is, um, and what is actually effective for what needs to be done. Oh, well, Catherine, thank you for that fantastic overview. You've really set the scene. And now we're going to um, hear from Amelia about specific legislation. So, yes, I would like to bring this kind of like a case study to in this landscape that Catherine has just set out and talk about the draft EU Artificial Intelligence Act, which is currently entering a trilogue negotiations. It's a, uh, negotiations between the three EU institutions, the European Commission, Council and European Parliament. And this draft text, uh, which is in the form of the regulation, was first proposed by the European Commission in April of 2021, and is part of the EU's sort of expanding and developed uh, digital strategy. Now, if adopted, it would be the most comprehensive, binding, technical uh, uh, set of rules governing AI um, to date. Um, and it is an umbrella regulation um, covering different types of AI systems and uh, addressing different types of harms and risks arising from the use of those AI systems. Now, the AI Act applies a so-called risk-based approach that is different rules and different sets of obligations apply to different uh, types of AI systems depending on the level of risk that they pose. And the way in which those risks are measured is not by the type of the AI system itself, but by the ways in which the system is used, right? This is something that Catherine as well uh, me mentioned. So it's a risk based on use sort of approach, if you like. Now, this risk approach under the AI Act reflects uh, in some ways other EU legislation in the digital sphere, like the Digital Services Act, but the significant difference uh, is here that under the AI Act, again, the basis of the risk uh, is the use of the AI system and not the AI system itself. Whereas, for example, under the Digital Services Act, which regulates online platforms, we look at the type of the online platform, right? Uh, whether it's a very large online pl platform um, or something just that provides mere conduit, uh, let's say, services. Now, the Act sets three levels of uh, risks. Uh, the first one is unacceptable risks, which uh, are simply the AI systems that the EU bans. So here we have, for example, subliminal uh, techniques, something that is aimed to deceive an individual to, to, and brings harm to an individual. Um, uh, for example, uh, dark patterns on internet. Um, as well as social scoring systems, those will not be allowed in the European Union systems that exploit vulnerabilities of specific groups based on gender, race, or, or other um, characteristics, um, real-time uh, remote biometric identification systems, 
uh, will also be banned, but I'll come to that in a moment. There will be probably a, a likely debate between the Parliament and the Council as to that. Um, and in general, the European Parliament, which has issued its own negotiating text in June, uh, sort of aims to increase, uh, to, to expand this list of prohibited practices. Um, so, so this is uh, an acceptable risk. Then we have high risk obligation, uh, high risk systems. That's where most of the obligations under the AI Act are located. I'll come to that in a moment. And then we have low risk obligation, uh, low risk systems. Uh, that's mainly transparency obligations for, you know, if an individual is interacting with a chatbot, that it would know that it's interacting with a machine. So it's just a transparency. Um, as I said, the, the, the bulk of uh, obligations are uh, around the high-risk uh, systems, and the classification of AI systems uh, as high-risk is very complex and technical. Um, and in order to understand this classification, one needs to really understand the broader uh, legal framework under EU law for the governance, uh, for the regulation of uh, marketing goods. And I won't uh, bother you with the details of that today, but just perhaps for those for whom it could be interesting, um, uh, there are sort of two blocks of high-risk systems, and the first blocks of AI systems that would be classified as high-risk are those that are already regulated under EU product safety legislation, um, the new legislative framework, and that, that legislation would require already conformity assessment. So AI systems that are components of products or are products themselves of systems that EU already uh, require uh, conformity assessment, those would be high risk. And then the second block uh, would be the sort of critical areas uh, that the EU lists in the Act. So if you use AI systems in education, employment recruitment, um, uh, social, um, social uh, public services, law enforcement, migration, uh, border control, that would also fall under the high-risk uh, systems. And then the obligations <coughs> of the EU Act would kick in, and those are heavy obligations, obligations for training data, for explainability, for human oversight, uh, risk management, and so on. And these, these, these are heavy obligations. Um, so this is a very broad overview of the AI Act itself, and perhaps just a final point on where, where do I think that this is going. I think the, the in, in the Trilog negotiations, one of the questions that will be most discussed will perhaps be the uh, ban of the uh, remote, uh, real-time remote biometric identification systems. I think the parliament, which wants to fully ban these systems, will be met uh, with some kind of resistance from member states, uh, perhaps countries like France, which is using uh, such systems and is planning to use um, uh, such systems during, let's say, Paris 24 Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there will be some debate and, um, and we'll see what happens with the AI Act later on. That's fascinating. Thank you so much, Amelia. Really Really, yeah, I just can't believe how, how you managed to condense, you know, the sort of richness and complexity <coughs> that is in that EU AI Act into just a few minutes. But, but a really interesting, uh, you know, to get to the sort of the risk-based approach that you were describing there in terms of how do you manage to legislate for something that has uh, such broad, uh, broad application. As you said, Catherine, it's not just a matter of introducing new legislation, it's also how existing laws are adapting and being applied, and we're going to hear more on that from Imogen. Yes, we are. So I'm, um, as, as I've already been introduced, an intellectual property lawyer, so I'll be answering my questions very much through that filter. Um, and in terms of existing laws, I'm going to look at, um, I suppose, this sort of broad brush ambition, at least in the UK, um, to foster innovation so far as AI is concerned and kind of look at, you know, do, do, as well as needing new legislation to be able to do that, what legislation is already in place? Um, because, you know, there are existing legislative structures that already address this idea of fostering innovation. And, and I am, of course, talking about intellectual property laws. Um, at a very high level, intellectual property laws exist to foster, and I suppose by foster I mean protect, human innovation and creativity. So 
we can't really talk about fostering innovation without thinking about these laws, because not only are AI innovators very likely to want to rely on them to protect their innovations, but also these laws, depending on whose perspective you're coming from, may well inhibit that innovation or protect very important parts of our society, of our culture. And I'm going to, at least at this part, talk about the AI innovator perspective, but I'm very much going to be returning to that other perspective, the sort of creative industry perspective, just um, to, to, to summarize it. So when we talk about intellectual property laws, and I'm gonna focus the debate on patents and copyright. I'm sure many people in the room here today know quite a lot about these laws already, but for those who don't then, patents broadly protect inventive ideas capable of industrial application. And the theory is that if you've obtained your patent, you can stop someone from copying your very inventive idea for up to 20 years. And that monopoly is really important to hold in your head. It is a 20 year monopoly. Copyright protects um, creative works, original works, and I'll come back to that idea in a second. And again, in theory, if you have, um, if you, if you have copy, if there is copyright in your work, then you can prevent someone from copying it and reproducing it um, for up to 70 years from the lifetime of, of the author, of the creator. Um, so you can see then that there are some huge advantages to intellectual property rules. <laughs> uh, AI and innovators will be looking very closely at them because if they're going to come into a market, if they're going to come into the UK and develop this technology, they're going to want to know that they have got protection for it. And I'll talk very briefly about the advantages, which I'm sure are evident to this room already. Um, you can, for example, get market exclusivity for your idea, for your inventive idea. Um, you can be, you, you can make sure that as a creator, you have set your space and defined your space uh, by, by marking your work with, with copyright. There's also licensing. If you do decide that you, you're very happy for other people to use your idea, you can of course monetize that and, and think and think about licensing structures that enable you to do that. So, so then the question that AI innovators are asking, at least, is do these laws that, that are currently in place uh, allow me to protect the, the, the innovations that I'm coming up with? And, of course, the answer is spectral because you can, um, for example, copyright, uh, it, it has been established for a long time, protects um, soft, you can get software, um, copyright attracting to software, sorry. And so of course there's software that's involved in, 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 in AI applications. Um, you can, depending on how your AI application is being used, obtain patents in very certain contexts, but that, that, is, a, that is a difficult discussion in its own right. Um, but, but, but I think part of the answer is to say that certainly there are laws there that will to some extent foster that innovation. But there are some tricky questions here because, of course, we know that AI is um, developing at pace. And there are some interesting questions out there like, what happens if my AI invents something? What happens if my AI creates something? And these are questions that um, the UK IPO has been consulting on for a number of years now, a couple of years, actually. And, and they're very much questions that need fairly swift answers to. Um, if I turn to patents, firstly, this question of whether or not an AI can invent uh, has actually been brought before um, many, many offices, UK, sorry, many intellectual property offices around the world. And particularly in the UK, um, there is a decision sitting with the Supreme Court at the moment as to, as to whether or not um, an AI can be named as the inventor on a patent application. The Court of Appeal for now has decided um, no, but there is a very interesting dissenting uh, decision uh, from Lord Justice Burst, which says that actually that's the wrong question to be asked, asking. We're talking about patent applications here and, and, and they're to be considered by an intellectual property office. And, and, and it's not for the intellectual property office to look underneath the statements in that application and ask, you know, broader philosophical questions about whether or not uh, whether or not inventions were, were were made to be protectable by for and by humans only, uh, and actually we should be asking this question in a very different uh, under very different legislative terms. In other words, is it you know should that entitlement to a patent, if indeed an AI can get one, 
be challenged instead uh, under, different, under different structures. So, so what that illustrates is that whilst these questions might seem quite futuristic, they are being brought before the courts, and we do need to understand these parameters to be able to then start to think about whether or not the laws in existence are, are, are able to foster innovation at the rate that it is happening. Um, and I suppose, you know, in, in copyright, we'll return to it, but there's some really pertinent questions being asked about to what extent do you let AI use copyright works, for example, because that can be a big, that will be a big thing in either opening up, opening up innovation or, or, or undermining um, creative works as they stand. So in conclusion then, when we talk about the legal landscape, yes, there are laws there, but the boundaries of those laws are being tested as we speak and very much the answers to those questions, which I'm sure will be developing over decades, to be quite frank, will um, go part way to showing how attractive we are or are not as a jurisdiction, at least from an AI developer's perspective. And, and I must stress, I will be returning to the alternative perspective, I'm sure, by the end of this discussion. Oh, well, thank you for <laughs> whetting the audience appetite for what's to come <laughs> later, Imogen. So I think already in answering that first question, you know, you've begun to see how, how rich uh, the, the, the picture is in terms of, of the making of new laws and, and, and regulation and the adapting of what's uh, in place already. And doing that at pace and doing that in, in a fast developing landscape really brings up some quite interesting risks and tensions for, for those involved in lawmaking. And I'm going to look at those now in a bit more detail with the panel. Um, starting uh, with Catherine, if we may, mm -hmm. uh, focusing particularly on uh, a recurring issue of bias and discrimination. So this has been very much in the sort of, uh, in the media, in the sort of public consciousness. Um, so what I'm gonna do to sort of structure an answer to this, just to give it a bit more sort of depth and roots, is to outline what I think are three critical features of AI that make it both different and need specific addressing within the legislative framework for discrimination law. I'm then going to talk about how this country structures its discrimination law and the way in which courts look at the issues that arise um, in discrimination cases um, in tech. And we've got some cases already, not so much AI cases, but where computer algorithms have been used, found to be either lawful or unlawful, and how those cases really work and what they turn on. So I'm afraid I'm going to go and stand up a bit because I'm afraid that is my handwriting on the blackboard. In a, in a, <laughs> Off in a, in a talk about you know, AI and tech, I have gone for the least technologically um, advanced. Um, and I'm afraid not even my husband really allows me to even kind of write on our whiteboard for the uh, shopping list, because you can see how bad my handwriting is. Oh, right, okay. Is that any better? Super, super. If it cuts out, and just please wave at me and, and tell me off. So those three things I was going to talk about um, AI. So. The first thing about AI, what makes it, what's the A in AI? Artificial intelligence. It, what, the A bit talks about that it, it is changing its own instructions. So that's what's different about a normal computer program where a human says, do this, do that. It has the power to change its own instructions. How does it do that and why does it do that? So it does it by what it's called machine learning. Now I'm gonna hugely simplify it. I'm sure there are people in the room who understand exactly how it does it a bit better. But essentially, the program is told what its aim is, and it is provided with a source that it can then read and learn from. So in terms of discrimination or analysis, if there is something biased or discriminatory or wrong in what it is looking at, then that is likely to follow through or could well follow through into what comes out at the other end. The third thing is, of course, it is still a computer. And what computers do is they're really, really good at following instructions. And that's actually quite different to humans. Um, so in human decision making, and uh, I can see Professor Elliot at the back of the class, everything I know about public law comes um, from him. Of course, in administrative law, we think of administrative decision making and discretionary decision making. The decision maker always has to keep their mind ajar. Now, you cannot write a computer program which keeps a computer's mind ajar. No, literally nothing will happen. You cannot have a big open end of a piece of code. The other thing that computers struggle with is sort of conflict in aims. And I tend to think of this um, uh, 
like uh, a, a toddler, um, and hopefully some of you will have experience of that, or possibly not hopefully um, at all. So if you say to a toddler, oh, learn about the world, but don't put your fingers into that electrical socket, they might well see that as a conflict in their mind, and you turn away for one minute and they've got their toys in the, in the plug. Computers are the same. They won't have that sort of inherent sense that you don't tell them about not to go and stick their toys in a plug. And those three features are really important when we come to think about um, discrimination law. So in this country, discrimination law, most of it comes through the Equality Act 2010, which was pieced together from lots of different pieces of statutory regulation before that date. And the structure of most of the forms of discrimination actually date, it's come from two sources. Um, firstly, it's the American civil rights legislation back in the 1960s. And then also the way that the EU treaties looked at discrimination law back in the 1970s. And the aim was to bring it to when the UK joined the EU to have a law that was exactly the same. And of course, you know, the case law shows that it didn't quite work like that. Um, it is both a civil wrong, so it's a tort, but also in public law, it's also public law unlawful. So you have these two sort of strands that live within the same statute. And the way it's ordered is that you have general principles, um, so concepts of direct discrimination, indirect discrimination, and then those are applied as duties in specific different sectors in slightly different ways with actually really quite complicated rules for you know, employment, education, universities, qualifications, bodies, transport, and all of that kind of thing. So I'm going to simplify it um, quite basically. Direct discrimination is where someone is treated less favorably um, on grounds of their, and then protected characteristics, so on grounds of their race or on grounds of their sex. So it's a big cause test. And um, we have some case law from, not AI, but from tech, um, in the insurance sector. Um, some of you might remember the days when um, women got car insurance cheaper than men. That's because on a statistical basis, women had fewer car accidents than men. Uh, but there is also um, law uh, prohibiting direct discrimination on grounds of sex in the provision of services. And the case went all the way up to the European Court of Justice. It's a case from the Belgian Consumer Rights Organization, which found that um, the distinction in relation to pricing was sex discrimination, and there was no provision for it to be objectively justified. Therefore, it was unlawful, couldn't be done anymore and all of the pricing completely changed. So what they looked at there um, was what exactly was it that was being done? Was it on grounds of sex? Yes, prohibited. There's then indirect discrimination, and this, I'm afraid, is the reason for my terrible, terrible handwriting. What this requires are the following ingredients. <coughs> it's helpful to think of it like a game of tennis in terms of who has to show what. So the first one, I've put it here, is the PCP. So the claimant has to show a provision, criterion, or practice. Basically, a something that is being done to everyone, so not just to people with a protected characteristic, but that puts those who have a particular protected characteristic at a particular disadvantage. So for one group, they will do less well by this algorithm, by this test, by this particular line of code. And that has to be a particular disadvantage, both at the group, you have to have lots of people, or you have to have a group of people that share the protected characteristic, um, and it also has to be suffered by the individual who's bringing the claim. So the PCP has to be identified by the claimant. The, the defendant then has to explain what, whether it actually is doing the thing that it's being said that they're doing. The claimant then has to show the particular disadvantaged group and individual. That's not the end of the matter, because the defendant doesn't lose if they can show what's called objective justification. If they can show that there's a legitimate aim so that thing that they're doing, you know, the algorithm, that they're doing it for a good reason, for a legitimate aim, and that what they're doing, the algorithm, is reasonably necessary in pursuit of that aim. They also, if what's happening is that the algorithm's actually somebody else's, they're just contracting with an IT provider that has the software that then does the something. They get out of jail free if they took all reasonable steps um, to eliminate uh, or avoid the potential for discrimination. And that last one, there's not a huge amount of case law on it, but is going to be really quite critical in the tech sector. So taking an example, um, facial recognition software, and there's been lots of case law, particularly in the US and a little bit in the United Kingdom. Um, certainly in its early days, and some people would say now, um, was less accurate for darker-skinned faces. Um, and less accurate meant that if it was used to detect crime, it would be more likely to pick the wrong people who had darker skin than those who had lighter skin. Therefore, those with darker skin 
projected characteristic on grounds of race will put it at a particular disadvantage in relation to the use of facial recognition software, the PCP, for the detection of crime. What the police forces who use it say is, well, actually, if protecting people from crime and actually detecting who's done it is a really important aim. We should be allowed to pursue that aim. Courts say, well, yes, you're allowed to pursue that aim. Question is, is, it, is the use of that soft software proportionate to um, the, uh, that particular aim? And that's where a lot of the battles are. And then, as I said, that fourth question, has the organisation that's using it used all reasonable steps to actually limit the degree to which it's likely to, to, to discriminate. And that's where going back to those three principles about what it is that AI does and doesn't do. Changing its own instructions, really quite difficult at the PCP stage. It's already difficult in tech, um, tech discrimination cases where you have to both explain what it, if you're for the defendant, explain what it is that the tech is actually doing in ways that a judge can understand and the claimant can understand. Um, but if the instructions are actually constantly changing, that leaves you in quite a tricky place at the PCP. So you can define a PCP very broadly, but then, of course, that's much easier to objectively justify. So these cases get very, very difficult um, at the PCP stage. Um, you also have difficulty in terms of, you know, there's potential difficulty in terms of this particular disadvantage stage. If you, can, if you know what it is that they've read and you know it's biased, then you can show it coming through. If you don't know where it's looked, much more difficult. Um, and then in terms of the, uh, going back to the toddler um, and the instructions, the all reasonable steps, there's a lot of talk about guardrails. How can we have guardrails within software that eliminates discrimination? You can see from this analysis, discrimination law doesn't really work like guardrails because you're dealing with balancing principles when you get to this stage. It's very, very difficult to code for something that's essentially a balancing exercise. But can you do something else? Can you require disclosure of exactly what the tech company is aiming to do in terms of the software? Can you require that they check stats on how much of, uh, how regularly? Can you require that they disclose them to you? So there are various steps that are softer steps that are the types of things that can be built in at this stage, um, which organizations, and this is where it's actually quite interesting sort of being involved in this world. As I said, there's some case law, but not masses of it, but there's a huge amount of discussion about buying the software and what do you need to build in at certainly stage four and stage three in order that you know what it is that you're buying and you're not buying something that will blow up the entire world. Catherine, thank you so much. Uh, you know, such, I think everybody here will be aware of the significance of, of issues of discrimination and bias uh, in the AI field, which have just simply been amplified uh, by developments in generative AI. And thank you for bringing that to life uh, for us, Catherine. But not the only risk and tension in seeking to legislate and apply our laws to this area. And we're now going to hear from Imogen uh, and then, uh, no, Amelia first, actually, and then Imogen on that. Yeah, so Catherine has very, um, very well described the, the huge risk of discrimination in AI, but of course there are other risks as well. And, uh, you know, with, the, with those risks and challenges arising, uh, there is also a quest to uh, figure out the best way to regulate those risks. Uh, and here, one of the pressing questions is uh, whether law can keep up with the rapid pace of technological development. This is um, something that is really on the minds of the legislators and not only them. And the unprecedented speed of technological development, especially in the area of AI, is uh, evident. Uh, for example, it has been estimated that the UK uh, AI market is worth today uh, around 17 billion, uh, whereas in 2035, it will be estimated around 800 billion. Um, the number of UK companies uh, uh, has increased around 700% over the last 10 years. And ChatGPT, which has been released uh, last November, has uh, collected more than 100 million users in just two months. So these numbers are really, um, uh, imp you know, impressive. Um, and the pace of development of this technology um, has caught by surprise even the, 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 the biggest authorities in machine learning in, in the AI field as well. So, for example, in his testimony to the Senate, uh, U.S. Senate Committee on Judiciary, Joshua Bengio, who is uh, the um, uh, award winner of uh, Alan Turing Prize for Deep Learning, 
together with his colleagues, uh, the other so-called um, AI godfathers, uh, Geoffrey Hinton and Jan LeCun, they had to revise the estimates of, what they, of when they think the human levels of cognitive competence in AI will be developed. And something that they previously were estimated, estimating uh, to, to come uh, perhaps in uh, tens of decades uh, and, and, and centuries, now they are estimating that this would come in, in perhaps the next decade uh, or a couple of decades or even a few years. Um, so one of the biggest topics, of course, uh, then is whether law can catch up with this sort of pace. And uh, a big topic here is, of course, the very, very fast development of the so-called foundation models. So just to bring another example, um, uh, here we see this race between law and technology very clearly. Foundation model um, is just something that essentially that refers to an AI model that is trained on a, a, a broad amount of uh, data. Uh, and the essential feature of a foundation AI model is that it can be adapted to uh, numerous uh, tasks. So this is really fascinating and scary at the same time. It can basically be adapted to uh, any task that we don't, it's, it's not a single purpose AI system. Um, and the technology itself behind the foundation model is not new. Uh, it's, it's based on the deep neural networks but, uh, that have existed for decades, but what is new is um, the fact that they are uh, the scale of foundation models, that they are built on um, billions of parameters, which makes them so adaptable to different tasks. Um, so uh, foundation models are used especially in, uh, in areas like uh, natural language processing, and ChatGPT um, is one of the examples, generative AI. Um, so now, why, why do we talk about foundation models so much and why even the UK has established a task force within the government um, to, to address um, foundation models is because uh, maybe something that relates to what Catherine has been talking, if you, if you have bias in the foundation model, then you'll have bias spread in all those limitless tasks. This is one risk. And of course, uh, having those you know, countless tasks, tasks that can be developed from foundation models, we also know that there could be harmful tasks and purposes that would be developed. So, of course, uh, this caught the legislators by surprise, the foundation models. And, and just to give a couple of examples, um, China, for example, it has um, uh, adopted a law in November last year, uh, which covers a similar, it covers deep fakes, which is a in a way, uh, the same um, uh, field that would foundation models would fall in. But because China adopted it five days before the release of ChatGPT, the law didn't take into consideration foundation models and became immediately outdated. Right? So China then rushed immediately and is still in the process of adopting um, uh, a, a specific generative AI law that would take into consideration foundation models. And then the EU Act, uh, initially proposed by the Commission, didn't, uh, didn't even mention generative AI or foundation models. It's for me a bust to, to stop talking about. <laughs> I'm not pressing anything. <laughs> um, and I'm finishing. Um, so we didn't even take into consideration AI, um, generative AI, um, but the Parliament is now trying to, to put that into the law, so we'll see where that goes. But this is just an example of this really really race between law and technology. Yeah, amazing, uh, amazing race as you, d you describe it. And those examples really bring it to life. So our final risk and challenge, we're going to hear from Imogen. Yeah, so I, I, I've sort of already foreshadowed this. And this is um, in intellectual property. And I guess I'm going to focus for the purpose of this answer on copyright. Um, I suppose, what do you, what do these laws exist to champion, if you will? Like, are they there to facilitate uh, the AI innovators, as I said, or are they there to protect um, human endeavor and human creation? And we've really seen that question come to a head in the context of generative AI and text and data mining. Um, so, so just taking a step back and just to remind you, we, we have this concept of the monopoly. So in copyright, that could be 70 years from the life of the author. And um, if you want to be able to use that, that 
that work, you would have to approach the author the, or, the, or the person that created the work and, and ask for a license. And, you know, in an ideal world, everyone would, would shake hands and say, yeah, no problem. But of course, that doesn't happen. And so if you decide anyway to press ahead and use those works, you are, uh, you know, by copying them, reproducing them, you are unlawfully doing so. And at that point, um, you know, obviously the situation can escalate um, to, you know, culminating in potentially a court preventing you from copying and re reproducing those works. So now let's hone in on AI. And I'm sure many people in the room are already well aware of how ma machine learning relies on many things, including the ability to be able to draw on large data sets, on huge amounts of materials that can be combed from, the, from websites, books, databases, um, music catalogues, all sorts of things. And it's learning from those materials in order to be able to be as clever as it is. Now, um, again, I'm sure everyone's already picked up on, on the punchline here. The majority of those works are probably going to be protected by copyright. So you come back to this tension yet again. If you're going to encourage your AI innovators to, for example, come to the UK, um, you, you're going to want to try and knock down these barriers in, if, you're, if you're adopting that extreme view and say, no, 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 sure. For, for the purposes of text and data mining, um, I, you know, don't worry about the infringement. We'll create an exemption. And that... I should say, is, is, is exactly what the government's initial position was. Now, this was um, after consultation um, that the UK Intellectual Property Office ran with rights holders, with, with AI innovators, so that there was a consultation. And we've touched on the speed of developments. I was involved in those consultations. They, they started, I think, about two or so years ago. That point, chat GPT, I mean, it was mentioned by a few people. I think you had to be really in the know to, to say that, oh, I've got a login for chat. GPT. Uh, and by the time the consultation had closed, I think even then ChatGPT wasn't what it was. And, and suddenly so the government announced this sort of, it, it sounded like a sort of an interesting exemption. Yes, for text and data mining only, it won't be a copyright infringement. ChatGPT blows up and then suddenly we have this huge problem where suddenly everyone realises and all the rights holders realise, oh my God, do we realise what is in, 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 in the motions here? And and that leads me to look at the rights holder perspective, um, and rightly so, because the creative industry in the UK is one of our most important industries. It is globally respected and, um, it, it, yeah, one of our strongest industries. And so from the rights holder perspective, to be undermine, proposing to undermine their copyright in this way undermines the whole point, I suppose, of being a creative. And, and I really want to emphasize that as well, because obviously one tends to come back to money in, in, these, in these types of debates, and that also really undermines the point of, of coming up with creative works. Um, and um, you could say that if AI is allowed to mine that creative output essentially for free, to turn it into a product that no doubt the hope will be is eventually monetized. That is, a, that is an injustice to the people who have probably spent many hours of their lives coming up with those works to facilitate that innovation, that money making that they might never well see. And so the government obviously retracted um, this proposal for an exemption and is back in consultation as to what that exemption should look like. But it's actually a really difficult question to answer. As matters stand, there is an exemption for text and data mining for non-commercial research purposes. And of course, the majority of AI innovators probably hope to monetize their projects. Um, what do you do? How do you solve that question? I'm not sure. We wait with bated breath. I think the government has promised some sort of, uh, a sort of further input by the end of this year, or I know it has said, said as much. Some suggestions on the table are to make licensing easier, uh, fine. How do you do that? Uh, other suggestions are to uh, are for, a, for, for any sort of AI creative output to tag every creative work that has been relied upon to come up with that. Well, that, that, that's all very well and good, but actually you consider the vast amount of materials that go into generating a single picture, for example, or a single output. Um, you, you can imagine that would be an incredibly long, long list of tags. And, and that leads me to the final point I'll make, which is the black block black box nature of AI 
would make this whole question even harder to solve because you could be an AI innovator with the best intention of the world and want to credit absolutely every single creative whose work you have relied upon and, and license. But if you actually don't know what exactly the decision making that's going on and, and, and then how are you going to be able to do that? So I'll, I'll stop there because I know we have got one more interesting, very interesting question to do. Yeah, so. this really is a whistle stop. Uh, whistle stop tour and I imagine people in the audience are going to be quite pleased that we're not asking you questions <laughs> at the end. So having uh, looked at the, the, the legal landscape across different systems and got a sense of the current volatility uh, and also in the second question looked at, at, at risks and challenges and tensions in, in making uh, a legal response to developments in AI. I'm now going to very briefly uh, ask each of the panelists to uh, get out their crystal ball and answer the question, what does the future hold? And Imogen, coming to you first. <laughs> well, I, I suppose if I were to go, go, go way into the future and be at my most provocative, I, I would um, begin to answer this question by asking the question and saying, is it appropriate that intellectual property laws, which were originally set up to protect human endeavours, is it appropriate that they're used in the context of artificial intelligence to provide monopolies uh, for inventions, for works that come as a result of using AI? So let's take patents as our example. And as I said, let's go way into the future and imagine that you can just press your big fat green button, as I imagine it, and out will come this fabulous invention that, that this incredible AI has come up with. And so off you go to the patent office and it gets rubber stamped. And, and there you have it, a 20 year monopoly that enables you to go out into the market, stop your competitors and or charge some fabulous licensing rates. Um, and all you've done is press this big fat green button. Now, is that fair and reasonable? Now, I've been really futuristic there, but actually, if we step it back and look to the near future, where application, AI applications are being used as part of that um, innovative process, perhaps in smaller, smaller steps, and where you still have the human very much important to that process because they are looking at the output, they're selecting output, perhaps developing it and building on it, um, you can still ask the question, well, how much does the human have to do in that process before you start to go, hmm, 20 years feels like quite a long, quite a long time. Um, to answer the question then, I'm, I'm gonna suggest that we do already have um, a, a sort of a legal toolkit that lets us, that, that will let us at least for the near future, filter out um, genuine innovations from perhaps more, <laughs> more sort of circumspect ones. And I'm gonna look at this on, from two perspectives. I'm going to look at the skilled person in patent law. Um, I'm looking to see if anyone's sort of nodding their head knowingly. <laughs> and then I'm going to look at routine testing. Now, the skilled person in patent law is this wonderful person that turns up to court, invisible, objective legal test. And whenever we have to answer the question, is this invention innovative, the skilled person steps in as this notional fictional person to answer that question for everybody. Of course, we all have big arguments about who this skilled person is and what skills they're equipped with, but ultimately they are uninventive, they have access to all of the state of art knowledge that is accepted to be good knowledge, they have access to, and this is the critical one, they have access to all of the tools that are generally accepted by industry to be state of the art and fairly typical tools to have access to. So, Casting into my not so distant future, and I'm, you know, we're all looking at this invention and being asked to decide how inventive it is from the perspective of this skilled person. And it comes up that this, uh, that, that various artificial intelligence applications have been used to help create this invention. When we come to look at the skilled person, I've, I, I am reasonably confident that we will start to give the skilled person access to the same. AI or very similar AI applications that are used in the innovative process. So then when we answer the question, has this been a genuine innovation, we can look through this filter and say, well, I think if you had access to the, sim you know, the similar tools, yeah, quite, quite, it is still inventive because they combine the tools in this really clever way, or no, it's not inventive because they've just, they've just run the process in the same way that everyone else would have run the process. And that brings me on to the second 
filter I said I'd mentioned, which is routine testing. We already have case law that says that no matter, uh, you, you know, if you've got a framework for your experiments that's fairly well set out and established, like, like for a particular disease area or medical indication, it's well established that you test the following antibodies in the following different ways and uh, in the follow, you know, for the following different indications um, at the following different doses, say, and I'm, I'm really going high level here, then it doesn't matter if <coughs> as a result of running that process perhaps hundreds of times, you've come up with something really clever and snazzy at the end of it. If that testing process was routine, you probably don't have an invention. Now, I've really summarized the law at a race, race of knots there, so someone will tell me that that needs to be nuanced. But you can start to see that if, with artificial intelligence, we make testing and innovation more routine, then it's going to be harder to say, aha, here's my really surprising result, because it will come back to that same question. Well, if the steps you took were pretty typical standard steps to take that anyone else, that this skilled person would have also taken, it doesn't matter how clever the result, it's not inventive. You don't, you don't get a pattern for it. So those, I've brought us back to the near future. I think there are still tools in, in legislation right now that will help us filter out genuine inventions or innovations. Um, and so at least for now, intellectual property laws, I summarise in five minutes, will survive the future of artificial intelligence. Thank you. So very briefly, um, <coughs> Amelia, what, what do you, what's think, in your crystal ball? I think if I had a crystal ball, I'd like to know what kind of regulation and how much regulation we need, I think. Um, just very briefly, what we see so far is a very fragmented picture. The legislators around the world are taking very different approach to AI regulation. Um, as I said, you, EU is aiming for this very you know, hard, um, binding, comprehensive uh, legislation. Um, UK is sort of... Uh, saying, well, we won't do that, we will uh, uh, go more of a principle-based approach and empower the existing institutions to regulate. U.S. is taking a step back and just contemplating of which way to go. Maybe it's their liberal uh, market and their approach to technology regulation in general. That's, that's, uh, that, that, that's the reason behind it. Um, or China is taking more targeted uh, legislation, uh, ta targeted uh, laws that it's applying currently. So... We see all these different attempts that are very different. And I think um, the, the question is, uh, which, which uh, do we need binding rules? Do we need principles? Do we need, how do we not over-regulate? How do we regulate enough? Um, and also, uh, how do we need international organizations? I, I think we probably need international organizations um, to step into this. OECD is doing uh, already work on this, United Nations and so forth, UNESCO. Um, but uh, but do we how sh how that should develop, and especially in in, in the midst of um, of the uh, artificial general intelligence, because machines will soon, <laughs> from what I hear, uh, think better than us. So, thank you. And finally, Catherine. So I agree with Imogen that we're going to um, spend quite a lot of time actually thinking really quite deeply about what it is to be human. So I'm going to go from Imogen's toolkit to then talk about tool makers, and I'm going to be really quite radical here. We, of course, are here in the law faculty and where we learn how to be essentially legal tool makers, both in litigation and also more generally. And I think there's something really quite exciting going on in law tech at the moment. We've talked about ChatGPT and large language models. Now, obviously, as lawyers acting for our clients, we are extremely protective about our own confidentiality and our clients' confidentiality. We can opt, for instance, in a, you know, if I'm acting for a client, I can't put all of my clients' policies or documents into ChatGPT or, frankly, anywhere near it. I can't a stick a draft judgment into ChatGPT because that once it's in, it is in forever. It's slightly scary. Sometimes there's talk on the internet about people using it in judgment writing. Yeah. Um, now, in the law firm environment and lawyers using AI, um, there is a lot of client pressure, essentially, to be innovative and to be seen as being up to date. And there are lots of businesses that are starting to create legal AI tools. And the one thing that they know absolutely that no one will sign up to their product until it is sorted is that it has to be absolutely cast iron in terms of client confidentiality. 
Now, I've already been slightly negative about the use of technical guardrails as being a way to ensure compatibility with anti-discrimination law, just because that's not an area of law that works like that. Law of confidentiality and protection of confidential information it does work rather more like that. So if technically it is possible to create an effective algorithm that is still useful and can harvest large data sets, because if you have too small a data set, it doesn't actually create um, anything particularly um, more than you know, a human could do or just essentially a kind of glorified calculator. If we're able to get that guardrail right, what can that then be used technically across much, much larger foundation model applications in terms of essentially stopping the end of the world. So I wonder whether actually us lawyers might possibly be at the forefront of technology. <laughs> well, a fascinating road ahead, and perhaps uh, we might get invited back in a few years to see how much of uh, that, that uh, prospective future came. <coughs> there, I know uh, our panellists are staying around for drinks, and please do... Uh, follow up with them for questions. Um, I'm going to welcome uh, Professor Louise Merritt to the stage to close our proceedings. But before that, uh, could you just thank our fantastic expert panel? Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted and honoured to have been asked to close these proceedings. I have a double connection as a, a woman in the law in Cambridge. I studied law at Trinity Hall uh, from 1989, and I'm also a, uh, been a member of the law faculty here for 20 years. I'm also delighted because I've got by far the easiest job, which is to be very quick, but uh, I'm delighted to be able to thank uh, the various people who've made this event possible. First of, and foremost, I'd like to thank, thank all our speakers, the uh, faculty participants and our moderators. As soon as I saw the lineup of people who kindly uh, agreed to participate today, I immediately relaxed because I knew it was going to be an absolutely fantastic event. I'd also like to thank Oke Adudu, who's uh, at the back over there, who is our director, EDI director in the faculty. Um, he was the initial champion of this event, uh, and he also helped me to uh, plan it. And I, Oke, I think you were responsible for the idea to have an AI panel, and, and I think everybody will agree that's, that's been fantastically interesting. <laughs> And I think the combination of having a sort of conversation and then a substantive topic uh, has worked really well. So thank you, Oke. Okay. I'd also like to thank uh, the faculty administrators and IT support uh, for everything they've done and let you know that recordings of the talks uh, will be available to watch back and share. Also, thank you to the Development and Alumni Relations events team for all their help in organizing this event. So as Pippa mentioned at the beginning, the inaugural uh, in-person Cambridge in Women in the Law event was in 2019. Uh, we then had an online event, but we're absolutely delighted to be able to have another in-person event this year. Uh, it's really important, I think, that this event continues and becomes a regular thing in our diary. Uh, it's important to maintain momentum in this space in celebrating and empowering and sharing our experiences of uh, women uh, as lawyers and women in Cambridge and the law generally. Thanks finally to everyone for coming to this event and supporting us. I hope you enjoy the rest of the uh, alumni festival weekend. Uh, and mirroring the last question to the panel, uh, using my crystal ball uh, and thinking what does the future hold, I'm delighted to say that the answer in the immediate future is a drinks reception outside, uh, which I hope you'll uh, all join us for. So thank you very much, everyone who's participated and for coming.